Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the beginning of this week's new studies. As we continue to look over these articles, shall we keep in mind that we are looking for our Heavenly Father's guidance so that we may more properly and directly understand what he would have us to consider? Shall we then ask his guidance and direction in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we assemble before you in this new week. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings of the Sabbath that has passed. We ask now that you help us so that our minds may be open to understand what we need to understand for this time in earth's history. As we consider these words, help us to apply the lessons that we've learned over the last several weeks. We thank you for all of the traveling mercies that you have provided. We thank you for Theodore's safe return and for all that are joining in this study and that we'll see this later on the internet. May your will be done. Help us now and direct us according to your will so that we may learn and be able to glorify you. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this ninth article that was written, entitled The View of Uriah Smith, begins that there has been much discussion through the years regarding Ellen White's endorsement of Uriah Smith's book, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation, especially is this true now in the time in which we live, as we see things happening with Turkey, Russia, and Islam in general. This endorsement has been used by many people to either establish or to confirm their belief on the Eastern question as regards the identity of the King of Daniel 1136 and the Kings of the North and the South of Daniel 1140. I, too, have taken her endorsement seriously as she plainly commends this book as one of great benefit to the reader, liking it to some of her own books, such as The Great Controversy, Patriarchs and Prophets, and even calling it God's Helping Ham. Now, as we look at, at just these first two paragraphs, is there anything that stands out to any of us regarding the comments that have been made? God's helping hand is not a blanket term. It's like saying, well, David was a man after God's own heart, but look at his great sin, and you're followed by a great, great repentance. So we have to be cautious about what we're reading. Agreed. Good point. What stands out for me is the dividing of the king of Daniel 1136 and the separation in this statement, of kings of the north and the south of Daniel 1140. Would it seem that the position of the author is that these are entirely separate parties, at least from these statements to begin with? Okay, Continue, continuing in the article. In consideration of this, the question is, how much does this endorsement encompass? Is it a blanket endorsement? In other words, by inference, would it be fair to say that Mrs. White states that the king of Daniel 1136 is France and that the king of the south is Egypt and that the king of the north is Turkey? And using the same line of reasoning, would she then go on to state that the seven heads of Revelation 17.9 are seven forms of Roman government? Now, we've covered a lot of this over the last several weeks. If this was being presented to us today, how would we respond? Then continuing, I have contemplated this for many years as I have studied Daniel 11. Through these years of study, I have been brought to a dilemma concerning this very issue, as I respectfully but very strongly disagree with the conclusions that Uriah Smith has arrived at in his study of Daniel 11. I have also realized that I am not alone in my disagreement. The question then becomes how to reconcile this major disagreement with the endorsement of Sister White. Is it possible to reconcile? Is it possible that there is a way that we can agree? What say you? In this article, one may need to read between the lines, so to speak, <clears throat> in order to, be f to fully grasp what I'm trying to say. There are two separate threads combined into one. 
Uriah Smith's interpretation and Ellen White's endorsement, the first up front and the second operating in the background. The main point cannot be to simply refute Uriah Smith or somehow sidestep Ellen White, but to see how these things line up in the context of our study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. Now, in my study of the prophecy of Daniel 11, I have made good use of thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation as an aid to understand the history that took place in the setting of the prophecy. It is my belief that history is being rewritten <clears throat> and that much has been lost, changed, or simply dumbed down through such services as Wikipedia and others. I don't know that I fully agree with that portion, but that's my opinion. In using this book, I have discovered two key defining statements made by Uriah Smith that have served as markers for me that determines where he went off track. In other words, it would be the same principle as applies to John Harvey Kellogg or A.T. Jones and Ellett Wagner. Inspiration tells us that the Lord worked powerfully through each of these men, but somewhere in their individual experience, they went off into error. The fact that they went off, however, does not negate the work and the message of these men before they slipped into error. The same is true for Uriah Smith, though his error was not of the same magnitude as was theirs, nor did he lose his hold on Adventism. He simply was not given the present truth for our time, and therefore came to some conclusions in Daniel 11, 36-45 and Revelation 17 that are not consistent with the present truth for this generation. What do you take away from this statement? Would you agree with the author? Would you disagree? And why? Well, you had uh, James White giving another view. Correct. So he was very much uh, had that possibility to consider whether what he was teaching concerning the latter part of chapter 11, if it was truth. And uh, he made some changes. He changed uh, a word. And so forth, so he wasn't uh, consistent in adhering to truth. Right. Now, the comparison of Smith with Jones and Wagner and with Kellogg, I think, are fraught with issues. Jones and Wagner gave a message most precious to the church and found that that message was almost entirely rejected by the leadership. Not by the membership, but by the leadership. Uriah Smith was part of that leadership. He was one that battled either to the face of or behind the backs of Jones and Wagner and their message, because he did not believe that it was in keeping with what other leaders had been presenting. So on the external portion, you have one one issue with Smith, but yet on the internal portion, you have another issue with Smith. However, this does not negate his work regarding the prophetic understanding of the present truth for his time. In other words, we cannot just randomly pick and choose which of his statements to accept or reject, but it is necessary to understand where the line is drawn. It is equally important to understand that he was not infallible in his interpretations. The same holds true for these articles. Mrs. White has much to say concerning the issue of infallibility and inspiration. Now, there are many with whom I am personally familiar that are currently presenting that Uriah Smith was a prophet on a level with Ellen White. There are many that want to say that Mrs. White was not infallible in many of the predictions that she made and that were given to her. Therefore, she cannot be a prophet. I don't find much with Uriah Smith that said that he has been 
infallible. Prophets are men such as we. Yet, I, I just have my personal issue considering Uriah Smith as more than an author. In that, in that paragraph, did he, just before it, he talks about, um, where he says that we are not to, um, how did he say it? Let's see. He can choose which of his statements is to be accepted or rejected. Is he talking about Uriah Smith? Yes. Well, I have to disagree with that. Okay. Because we are to test the spirits, right? Amen. No, on, on that, brother, I would, I would be in agreement. We need to be testing the spirits. We need to be looking at all of this. And as, as was being presented a few minutes ago, we do have the example of James White. We also have James White's counterpoint to what Uriah Smith had been presenting. Now, the first of these two key statements are found on page 264 to 5 in chapter 11, a literal prophecy which deals with verse 36. Here, he is taking this from the 1897 version. And his note, the reasoning United Smith used for making the change has been removed from the 1944 revised edition. Now, while I recognize this is just a personal issue, I prefer to go back to source documents when I'm dealing with a situation like this. This was why when we did the, the series on the articles that led to the book, Thoughts on Daniel. We went back as far as we could. We could not observe the Sabbath school classes that Smith taught from his study, but we could read the Review and Herald articles that were originally published. And if I'm if I remember correctly, this book, Thoughts on Daniel, and then Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation went through at least three, if not four, revisions. So he continues, before we quote Uriah Smith, here is the verse in question. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Starting in the first paragraph under verse 36, it reads, The king here introduced cannot denote the same power which was last noticed, namely the papal power. For the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. How is Smith making this very blanket deduction? It continues, take a declaration in the next verse, nor regard any God. This has never been true of the papacy. Interesting, isn't it? That he sees, Smith sees that this was never true of the papacy. Please hold on for a moment. Thank you. <clears throat> God and Christ, though often placed in a false position, have never been professedly set aside and rejected from that system of religion. The only difficulty in, apply, in applying it to a new power lies in the definite article, the, for it is urged, the expression, the king, would identify the one last spoken of. If it could be properly translated, a king, there would be no difficulty, and it is said that some of the best biblical critics give it this rendering. Mead, Wintel, Boothroyd, and others translating the passage, a certain king shall do according to his will, thus clearly introducing a new power upon the stage of action. Now, we've covered this in the past. The Hebrew does not support the way that Smith, Mead, Wintel, or Boothroyd are making this verse to read. I would also have to believe that Jensenius 
would not be able to support this either. So Smith is taking a leap here, saying these men, which he has reliance upon, believe that a different translation would be more correct. What is our thoughts today? From what we've studied already, what we've already covered, would we agree with Smith or do we disagree with him? Yeah, we disagree. I agree with you, brother. We have to disagree. Here, Uriah Smith is changing a word in the scripture that significantly changes the meaning of the passage. Though it may seem to be a small change, it allows him to now introduce a new power, that of France. Before, he could not, and now he can. Was Smith introducing France in this portion? Or was he more attempting to rely upon Islam? Well, he is introducing France. Okay. Um, Later on, that has an effect in that Islam will be there in verse 40. All right. So is he introducing two new powers then into this into this scripture? And how would we justify this in line with the prophecies that we've already seen studied on Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9, and 10? When we read carefully what he is saying, we see that he clearly understood that the king of verse 36, as stated, would have to be the papacy, as no other power had been introduced since verse 31. He also clearly understood that in order to introduce a new power in verse 36, he would have had to change a word to allow for that new power. This point will become even more relevant when considering the nature of the relationship of this king with the kings of the south and the north in verse 40. The second key statement is found on page 659 of chapter 17, entitled Babylon the Mother. In dealing with verses 8 to 11 of Revelation 17, starting with the paragraph under the subheading called the seven heads, we read, the seven heads are explained to be first seven mountains and then seven kings or seven forms of government. For the expression in verse 10, and there shall be seven kings, should read, and these are seven kings. Emphasis added, note this statement has also been altered in the 1944 revised edition. What's the effect of these revisions upon many that are reading this book for the first time? Again, Uriah Smith is changing a word that allows him to connect something he could not connect before. Here are the verses in question. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. By changing one word, he is able to state that the seven heads and the seven mountains and now the seven kings are all one and the same. He then goes on to delineate the seven kings are seven forms of Roman government, linking them back to the seven mountains and then to the seven heads. He is able to do this because he changed the word from their to these. Again, a seemingly small change, but huge in its significance. It should be noted that this interpretation of Revelation 17, 9 through 10 take, comes to us clear back from 1582 in the Catholic version of the Bible, the Douay Reims version, ninth verse reading, and here is the understanding that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, upon which the woman sitteth, and they are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he is come, he must remain a short time. Considering this, I have compared these verses and found that almost without exception, the same interpretation is transmitted to many Protestant versions of the Bible. Any thought on this? Any comment about what he's presenting here? 
Yeah, okay. So um, I wasn't following it completely. So where is the change that that was made? So what does the the do a Reams version have to do with this? Because it says they are seven kings. Or when, there are seven kings. These are seven kings. When we were going through this, Smith changed the word there to these. So did he actually? Well, in the 1897 edition of Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, apparently that change had occurred. I don't recall that happening in what we studied to begin with. However, we did not go into Smith's thoughts on Revelation. Yeah, and and you know maybe it's just a typo. I don't think he would change it to you know the word itself like that. Maybe that's something I'll need to look up and take a look yeah, at. You have to, yeah, but you know sometimes typos happen that have nothing to do with you know people just don't pick up on them, right? But. Um, but is, it, does he say there are seven kings should read and these are seven kings? That's what he's saying that that was in the 1944 revised edition. He's saying or that was also 18, in there. He's saying it was in the 1897 edition and taken out in the 1944 revi revision. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because we never looked at that. But. So, yeah, because that can't be a typo. So he's actually going to argue, that is, Smith is arguing. Maybe he's not changing the word, but he's just saying, you know, we can read this as these are seven kings. I don't think you can do that. Definitely the Greek doesn't support that. Who is doing the altering? Is it the editors then? Well, Publishers? it's hard to know exactly what. I mean... There is a sentence, alive in there are seven kings that should read these are seven these are seven kings. So that was be Rise Smith's words. Right? Is that what we understand? Wasn't there another change that he attempted the uh, act king instead of the king? Yeah. Or something? Yeah. Okay. So he's just using this as an, another example that Smith can play around with the words. Right? Correct. Now I'm I'm looking as as we're talking right now I'm looking at the 1865 edition of Thoughts on Revelation. Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation? No, the the original was published on Revelation in 1865 followed by his Thoughts on Daniel and then they were combined I believe into one book about 1882. Oh. That's interesting. Okay, but in 1944, was Smith alive still? No. So it's the publishers. Correct. Revi revising. Okay. Okay, so that's uh, Revelation 17 verse 10, and um, looking at the Greek. While you're looking at the Greek. Yeah, just I I it Greek. So this word is the first person singular present indicative. Third person, they. So I guess you could say they are five kings. You could say that. But I'm not good enough at Greek to really understand the syntax. Iran's better at Greek than me, but all I can do is... Uh, look at the words. I don't fully understand the sentence structure. Okay. In the 1865 edition. Hey, I'm sorry, Brother Dwight. Go ahead. So in the Bible, it says we in verse 10 and 17, right? That would be correct. So he's changing. He said, A, there, and there are seven kings. He's changing it to these kings. Is that these, what you're are, saying? these are seven kings. But and these are seven kings instead of there there is are seven kings. Yeah, now in the Bishop's Bible, so that predates the King James, they actually have uh, they are also seven kings is part of verse nine. And verse ten starts five are fallen, which is interesting. 
All right. <clears throat> so they added to change it to these instead of there. <clears throat> Smith is supportive of that. Now you're saying in in the eight nineteen forty four edition they removed that or they changed it? That is what the author is saying here. Okay, because I'm looking that's right not now. How I read what he's saying when he says this statement has also been altered, right? I think what they say is it's the same in the nineteen forty four revised edition. That's the way I read what they're saying. What, okay. what he's well. I'm looking right now at a copy of the 1865 edition on thoughts on the revelation. Yeah. The paragraph here states the following. The seven heads are explained to be first seven mountains and then seven kings or forms of government. For the expression in verse 10, and there are seven kings, should read, and these are seven kings. Right. So they but, have the same same alteration. So Smith had that same alteration from the first time that he had this book published. Yeah. And it, yeah. So now, but does it course, does it does it change anything? Well, well, that changes lots of things if that if that was the case. So I take I've taken the position that that when it says there are seven kings, that that is not referring to the seven heads and the seven mountains. Okay. But, you know, I'm not an expert in Greek. And some translations suggest that, such as bishops, which predates the King James. Uh, but not all translation do that. Now, some of them, some of them, um, some of them do. They, they actually put that there are seven kings. They attach to verse nine. Quite a few translations actually do that. The easy-to-read version does that, and the Bishop's Bible, and some others. So, so you know, for him to do that, that there's actually a lot of support for that. Whether the Greek actually supports that or not, it's hard to say. But that verse, there's quite a few translations, actually, where that they are seven kings is part of verse 9, not verse 10. Okay. So they put a continuation. The idea that that many translators have is that there's seven heads, there are seven mountains, there are also seven kings, which now, is how we've always understood it. But I've suggested that the seven kings are not the seven mountains or the seven heads; that these are something added. But you know, I can't support that at this point. You know, like I don't have some definitive way to say that. Anyway, that's that's my two cents. Your tuppence is greatly appreciated. Now, the premise is made that Uriah Smith is changing a word that allows him to connect something that could not connect before. As we just addressed, this has been being addressed by many Protestant commentators, not just Smith. Now, I tremble at this situation because are we not given a warning that those that add to the book of Revelation or those that take away from the book of Revelation would be cursed? You know, here it's just a matter of translation, though. Like, how do you translate this? Okay. So not adding or taking away. It's just, he's just saying that, that the Greek would support that these are seven kings, not there are seven kings. But I, I don't know, you know, if, if that's the better translation or not. I'd have to spend more time looking at it. But there, there seem to be divided, because I have, like, on my computer, I have 40-some different translations, maybe 60 different translations. So looking at it just in a, a comparison um, with this verse... It's uh, it's pretty divided on how they're going to to translate that. So you know, so I got uh, yeah. So there's lots of different choices. Boy, there are seven kings seems, and they are seven kings. Yeah, there are also seven kings. Yeah, I don't I don't know enough to 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 say which way it should be translated. 
maybe Iran could help us with that. But uh, okay, anyway. yeah. So I don't think he's. You know, it's not changing, adding or changing words or, or removing things. It's just it's just a matter of how do you translate that that Greek phrase, and where do you divide the verse as well? So different people divide it differently. So as we as we were covering <clears throat> that this interpretation of Revelation 17, 9, and 10 was also found in the Douay Reims of 1582. Is this important for us to consider? Well, I, I don't know about that Catholic Bible, but, you know, you got the Bishop's Bible, which, you know, another Protestant Bible that, that would support it as well. So, Well, it's interesting to me. Because this Douay Reims version was being presented 48 years after the establishment of the Jesuit order. The subject is the seven heads, and the angel is letting John know that it will require special thought to understand what these seven heads are. Because of this, he then gives John something to consider that will redirect his mind into a certain train of thought regarding these heads. He is not directing John's mind to the seven kings in the next verse, but is letting him know that there is something to consider about the seven heads that his current mindset will not allow him to see. One of the things to see in Uriah Smith's interpretation of both texts, Daniel 11.36 and Revelation 17.10, is the fact that both prophecies are connected. And when he changed a word in the one, he found that he must then change the word in the other. With this in mind, it is of interest that he originally wrote Thoughts on Revelation first. This was written in 1867, and then six or so years later in 1873, he wrote Thoughts on Daniel and then combine them into one book in 1882. Okay, I just have a question. How is he saying that these two texts, these two verses are connected? How is Smith connecting them? I don't find that he's provided any evidence for that. Yeah, because I don't see what, what you know, because I understand how Uriah Smith understands the seven heads, right? Because he's he's going to take them as, as seven forms of Roman government. So... How would he connect this at all to Daniel 11, verse 36? I Maybe he is he's saying that because Smith needed to change a word, that that is the connection between these. But that, that doesn't sound like what he's saying. Okay. He says, he says, one of the things to see in Uriah Smith's interpretation of both texts is the fact that both prophecies are connected. And when he changed a word in the one, he found that he must then change a word in the other. Yeah. And so, all right. Okay. So Iran has a comment. He says, just looking at the words, it would read that there exist seven kings. Do they say something else would maybe be by some type of implication in the context of what is being said? That's the way that I would look at it too. Now I have in front of me uh, a Greek interlinear, which is, which is helpful. And, and the way it reads in Greek is you got Kai, which is just your conjunction and. And then, you know, uh, Basilius, uh, Sovereign, and then Seven, Hepta. And then um, and then it's that word they are, that's, I'm not good at pronouncing Greek, but S-C, A-C. They are is the way it's translated here. But but the idea is that it, because it's, it's in, in the plural, um, you know, so it's just saying that they are, they, and there are seven kings. They are, right? Is that the way you understand it? It doesn't have to be that it's referring to the previous ones that these, these are, Aran? Um, I'm not really an expert in that, but um, I would say it could be there are. Yeah, that that's the way that I would look at it, but yeah, I'd but I, th I think part of it is most of the, the translations that are going to say that, like, they are they are seven kings or these are seven kings are actually going to put that 
attach that to verse 9. So they're going to see it as a continuation of verse 9. There's seven heads. And it's going to say, because if you look at, at the, it says, um, here's a mind that has wisdom. There are seven heads, uh, the seven mountains. Let me see. Here's how do we look at that. Same spot in the lake to hold the wisdom. The seven ma- the seven a mountain, they are seven. Let me see. This doesn't make sense. Oh, okay, I see I got part of it being cut off. Just hang on. There we go. So the seven, so what it says here, the seven, the head, seven a mountain, they are seven. So that's let's that's the word order in the Greek, which is kind of hard. What where the woman to sit down super in, super imposition, uh, right? She is. I know this is a little bit sort of kind of technical, but the idea here, it's going to use that word. They are seven. So they are seven mountains. So it's going to use that same. Greek word, um, and then they are uh, seven kings. So it's the same structure. Can Can I ask a question? I'm sorry. So they switch the word they are and seven. They're switched around. So they have a king seven they are. The other one says a mountain they are seven. I don't know if that word order matters in Greek. Does they or these, which one says is a future tense or a past tense? Nothing to do with future or past tense. It's just a present tense. But but that's not really the point. It's the point is, it is when it talks about these seven heads and seven mountains, and then it introduces these seven kings. The question is just introducing there are seven kings as well. Or is it saying these seven uh, mountains are seven kings? And those are quite different um, interpretations. So I don't know much about the word order in Greek. How I don't think it's that important. But it's interesting here that that it's switched around. All right. So, this, so the seven mountains are seven. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Right. And then it says, and seven kings, they are the five to fall, um, to fall, which is kind of interesting that that word is doubled. Which word is that? To fall. Okay. They are five to fall, to fall, and, and the one he is, the else not yet to come, to come. Is and that in the never, he, is that in to the King James or is that in? This is just Greek. It's this just, Greek. I'm just oh. it's Greek interlinear. Uh, so I'm not sure. Maybe no, maybe it's not doubled. I think it's just a variant reading. Is that's what this is? Okay. I don't. I don't know. I think that might just be a very. I don't think it's doubled. I think there's just different way in which it's spelt. Okay, I see. Yeah, I've, I've never used this into linear before. So, yeah, so different, different. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't really speak with any authority on this. But but what we see is that there is definitely, um, yeah, so it's, yeah, that's just a variant. So that's why it has to fall. It's just two different ways of spelling it, uh, two different forms of the word. Let me just read the chat there, the strong definition might help. No, that's not helping. That has nothing to do with what we're looking at. Yeah, it's the word you're looking at. The No, it's not the word we're looking at. Which word that's, are you looking at? Uh, we're looking at the word... Um, to fall? No, okay, yeah. But we're not dealing with the, the fall. We're dealing with just the word they are. Well, I was speaking to your thing about being doubled or whatever but it is yeah uh, it's just you know, there's just two different spellings of the word or two different forms of the word in different in different documents that's all does that make sense so yeah the, the strongs doesn't help us there because okay. it's not going to show the different forms of the word it's just going to tell you what the the word is 
So it's not a different word in a different document. It's just a different form of that word. Does that make sense? Because Strong's never tells you the form. Well, that it tells you some things. It'll tell you sometimes if something's masculine or feminine in Hebrew, right? Mm -hmm. But there's lots of different in Greek. There's all different forms of words debate depending on on the syntax and structure. And so sometimes in different documents, the there'll be a different, slightly different spelling. Okay. But, yeah. So so we just don't know. I mean, Uriah Smith could be correct. He could be wrong. We don't know at this point. I, I don't think he can definitively say it has to read that way. Okay, Dwight? All right. Now, the author continues. It should also be noted that the words is and and in Revelation 17, 9 and 10 are supplied words by the translators. The word there is not a supplied word. The same is true in Daniel eleven thirty six with the word the. It is not a supplied word. The fact that they are not supplied words should cause us to move with extra caution especially in regard to Miller's rules. Number one, every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. And also rule number four, to understand doctrine, bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know, and let every word have its proper influence. And if you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. This, again, this brings us again to the validity of the King James Version of the Bible. This version... Hey, was... Just before we go on here. Good. So I'm getting really nitpicky here. Sorry about that. No, I enjoy uh, it. Okay, so first he says, is and and are supplied words. Well, right. when you use like is and and, you know, I mean, you have to make things make sense in English. Right. But he doesn't tell us which is and and. And obviously in verse 9 it says... Here is the mind which hath wisdom. So if we try, if we just said, and here the mind which has wisdom, they're just, because in Greek there there is a word for is, and here it just doesn't exist because in Greek they don't need it, but in English we do. And then the, the seven heads are seven mountains in which the woman sitteth. That's all just no added words. And then, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is... And the other is not yet come. So that and there is also added. Now, if we had, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. You, you could do that. You would just have to have a new sentence. Right. But it wouldn't change the meaning of it in any way. Right. So to, to, Put the and there, the reason why they have to put the and is because in Greek there is a word for and, right? Chi. Um, but they don't have that word there. But it would still be fine. It's not so I'm not sure why he brings up this point. It just to me is kind of pointless. It it seems like misdirection or something. But I guess it's probably he, he wants to deal with uh, this issue of the King James which I don't agree with him on, but anyway. So his point for giving reference here to Rule 14. This brings us again to the validity of the King James Version of the Bible. This version was one was the one our pioneers used to establish our prophetic foundation, and as such is the one referred to in Rule 14. We must believe that God will never forfeit his word. And we can have confidence that he takes notice of the sparrow and the numbers of the hairs of the head, or numbers the hairs of, the, of our head, and will guard the translation of his own word and throw a barrier around it and prevent those who sincerely trust in God and put implicit confidence in his word from erring far from the truth, though they may not understand Hebrew or Greek. Regarding this last rule, even the use of supplied words of the King James translators would come under the guardianship of God. The only instance I have found that one does not belong in the text 
is in early writings, page 74.2, where Ellen White uh, references the word sacrifice found in Daniel 8, 11 to 13, and by inference in Daniel 12, 11. This is in reference to the daily. She qualified to make this distinction, whereas we are not. Now. Okay, can I comment on this? Please. Okay, so. So he, he's, he's taking the position that we need to always accept the King James and we can never look at the Hebrew and Greek, basically, which I don't take that as what Miller's rule says. Now, obviously, we can understand God's word with, without understanding Hebrew or Greek, right? We, we, have, we have other tools like concordances and so forth, right? where we can compare different words. In a sense, that's, without knowing Hebrew, we can compare scripture with scripture. We can look up that word and compare other places that it exists. Now, there's a difference between a lexicon and a dictionary. Um, so we have Strong's Dictionary, which will just give us the meaning of a word and, and all the different ways that it's translated. Uh, a lexicon, uh, will actually give you the verses where you can look at and compare the use of the word. That is, you can understand the use, the meaning of the word based upon how it's been used in other places. So it's, it's, it's a little, it's a, it's a better tool than a dictionary, right? And, and if you know a bit of Hebrew and Greek with a lexicon, because you can have an Englishman's lexicon and you can have an actual Hebrew or Greek lexicon that's, that's dealing with uh, you know, somebody who can read Hebrew or Greek help you compare. But I think it's part of comparing scripture with scripture, right? To look at at these words. What you don't want to do is depend upon some scholar who tells you that a verse has to be translated a certain way, even though maybe other scholars disagree, and you have no idea how, because you don't know Hebrew or Greek, you don't have to worry about that. God can lead you to understand his word by comparing scripture with scripture. So you can, you can do that, right? You can compare scriptures. But sometimes, you know, we can be misled. And it is helpful, you know, to look at the Hebrew or Greek. But it's not necessary, except that when other people are making alterations to a, to a verse, we have to say, or, or do they have the authority to do that? Such as when Uriah Smith says, well, if it said a king, right? Well, we can look at the Hebrew and says, you know, it's Hamelik, you know, it's, it says the king. So you understand what I'm saying? I, 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 and I don't take the position that, you know, the King James, like I'm not a King James onlyist. There are some people who take that position because I think there are things that we've seen in the King James that are hidden, that is God hid them from us in the past, that once we start looking deeper into the text, um, that we find details that, that the King James translators didn't intend. And especially in Daniel 11, because what is the position of the King James translators when they're translating Daniel chapter 11? What is their view about the king of verse 36, for instance? Or... Right. How, how do they understand it? Well, I think they would probably connect it with Antiochus Epiphanes. Right. So they're going to connect it. So they're translating it based upon their understanding that it's Antiochus Epiphanes. Right. Much of the, much of Daniel 11, they have already interpreted it. And so, you know, we can say, well, God has preserved his word. Right. Which is true but not just in the King James. He's done it in other ways. Uh, also, so, uh, this year. Yeah. So he's saying that the only, or is it he says something about the only, I have found that the, the only instance I have found that, that one does not belong in the text. So he's going to refer to the word sacrifice. Yeah. But we would maybe say there are, that's only one that Elm White points out mm -hmm. but there would be other ones 
there that don't belong in the text that she doesn't point out, yeah. such as Daniel 11, where it says the, in the glorious holy mountain rather than and the glorious holy mountain, maybe. Yeah. For what that comes to mind. So there may be other instances. Yeah. Where so the word doesn't belong in the text, but Ellen White just doesn't focus on it. Yeah. So he says Ellen White can do that, but we can't actually touch the King James. We, we're not qualified to to do that. So basically you would say everybody in the world has to trust the King James, even if they don't read English, that that is sort of the standard of how that text should be translated rather than looking at the Hebrew and Greek itself. And, and I don't think that that's really what um, Miller is trying to argue. He said, basically, God, is, God has protected his word in the translation. We understand that. We, we can trust the Bible. Um, and if we put implicit confidence in his word, we're not going to be far er, erring far from the truth, even if we don't understand Hebrew and Greek. That is, God has made it so that we can read the Bible and, and understand it. But, but he's not even arguing here for the King James, per se, right? Because other translations existed. He's just saying that we can trust the Bible, that it's, that, you know, it's, it's reliable, that we can, we can understand the truth. We don't have to know Hebrew and Greek. That's the way that I take his position. But he's, he's taking the position, this, this author, that, that basically we have to stick to the King James, which I think he's going to paint himself into a corner if he does that. Okay. Can any good prophecy come out of Laodicea? When we examine the reasoning of Uriah Smith and his decision to change a word in Daniel 11.36, it is of interest to note that he turned to Protestant commentators to confirm his decision. Remember Samson using the Protestant millstone to grind the Protestant wheat. By this time in our denomination history in 1882, there had already been a major departure from the use of Miller's rules. Just as Protestantism had experienced its moral fall by 1844, so we had started our descent into the Laodicean condition by 1852. Review and Herald, 10th of June, 1852 is referenced. Protestantism was no longer a safe guide, especially as pertaining to prophecy. Just as the papacy would not admit of being the second persecuting power, so Protestantism will not admit to being the third persecuting power. Both are brought to plain view in these prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and each will turn the prophecy so that it does not apply to them. They are blinded to their own identity by their incorrect methods of biblical interpretation. The dividing line in Uriah Smith's ability to correctly identify, interpret the literal prophecy of Daniel 11 is verse 36. Here is where he lost the perspective of the three great persecuting powers. These three powers are established by the correct understanding of the daily as paganism. And if this perspective is lost, it must then look to the kings of the south and the north to provide the context for its interpretation. Although he had the correct view of the daily, he lost the greater context when he ascribed the king of verse 36 to France. Any thoughts? Well, he talks about Samson. And yes. grinding the Protestant grindstone, right? They make Protestant wheat. So I, I don't really see how he's making that application. Is he saying that the, the Philistines are Protestants? That would seem to be be the way he's approaching it. Now we had connected Edom with an Ammon to be Protestants, typifying typifying that, and they are mentioned alongside them in uh, Ezekiel chapter 35. So we sort of, uh, there was some hesitancy, hesitancy with uh, connecting the false things to the Protestants there, but maybe there is a, an application. I don't know how he's 
making that connection. All right. The context of Daniel 11 cannot be determined by the king of the south and the king of the north, but must be determined by the three great persecuting powers of God's people, paganism, papalism, and apostate Protestantism, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Would we agree with this statement? If so, how would we agree with it? And if not, why would we disagree? Well, at the, the end of Daniel 11, we have connected the dragon power to be in the Egypt, the beast to be in the king of the north, the false prophet to be in the glorious land. So um, some, some of the way he's wording it there just doesn't really, it seems a bit clumsy. Yeah, well, he said, tends to want to put paganism with sort of um, spiritualism, right, Dwight? That's what he's I done. See, in his... I can see that, yes. Yeah, because I'm reading over his, his earlier articles. And uh, so that seems to be, I haven't read everything, so, but that's what he would look at, is paganism is just spiritualism. So semantically linking paganism with spiritualism, leaving papalism in its place, and then placing apostate Protestantism as the false prophet. And I believe that in the past that the false prophet had been being placed as the United States. Correct? That's what it seems to be. Okay. The kings of the south and the north operate within the confines of these three powers. In other words, the king of the south and the king of the north are always defined by their relation to the larger entity. Up to verse 31, the king of the south and the north are defined by their relationship to paganism. And in verse 40, they are defined by their relationship to papalism and then to apostate Protestantism. I'm questioning if this is not a leap to say that the king of the south and the north are being defined by their relationship to paganism and papalism. Yeah, well, I've never, that seems to be one of his main arguments. Okay. But I have a hard time with that. I mean, so, because we say the king of the south is spiritualism, he says, well, that's paganism, right? Right. King of the north is papalism. So that seems to be the position that he's taking. Um, right. And, and his next paragraph, I don't know if that makes sense either. But so he's he's got some. So so part of the thing when I look over his his articles. So he talks quite a bit about methodology, which I always look at as a, a red flag that his people will will put out Miller's rules and then not really follow them. Right. Right. So it's just it's just a way of slipping things under the door, if that makes sense, because you need to be very transparent when you're when you're when you're presenting your arguments. Why? And 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 you need to understand your premises. What are your basic premises? What are your assumptions that you're using? And you shouldn't really hide those. Right. And so people should be able to follow your logic from pre premise to conclusion. Right. They should they should be able to see what your premise is. They should it should be clear, cut, well defined, and then why you draw that conclusion. If if you're always making these arguments where you've never proven any of your premises, you've never you you just stated them as you need to accept it, then then, you know, it's, to me, that's not the way you do it, right? You, you need to make it really, really clear. So he keeps, you know, uh, seasoning his, his articles with all of these things about interpretive keys and like, um, you know, using Miller's rules and so forth, and that we need to use the King James. But he doesn't really follow what he's saying. He doesn't he doesn't follow his own methodology and he does a lot of leaps and and then just things that he throws at us that we have to accept but he hasn't proven them using millage rules that that's the way that I look at it 
But, you know, sometimes it's difficult because you have a lot of things that you want to present and, and you may not show all the, you know, you may assume that the other people accept some ideas. But here he's got a lot of ideas that we wouldn't generally accept. And yet he hasn't proven them. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's direct. Okay. Now, there's still quite a bit to cover in what's left of this article. But our time now is coming close. We'll okay, reach- just, just a question here then. So, right. so, um, so I'm going to be here tomorrow. Right. I don't think I'm going to be here Tuesday morning. I still might be here Tuesday morning for the study. I might leave after that. I haven't planned what my my okay. itinerary yet for this next week. Uh, I know where I have to be on Sunday. That's basically the only thing I know. So I'm not going to be here. And so you're doing this series on, and you've chosen the three articles uh, of his series uh, eight, nine, and ten, right? Correct. Now, yeah. given given the number of references he makes to his um, consideration of Samson, would it be a worthwhile segue to look at that article as well? Probably. I, I'm just saying that you know I'm not going to be here for a while. You have time to go through some of this stuff, right? Um, now people can find out who he is quite easily by just, you know, putting some of these statements in quotes and doing a search. What's um, your friend of yours? You're saying? Yeah. Okay. And, and you don't really want to talk about who he is. Well, that's irrelevant. okay. To be direct, this is a friend of mine. This is the friend that brought me into the movement. I will send an email so that you can link to all of his articles. So far, there are 12. He's having trouble writing his 13. There are many things that we have addressed that we have points on which we are in agreement. There are some things that we have addressed where we do not agree. Mm -hmm. Now, this article that he has presented and this is my opinion, and I'm trying to gauge more what your thoughts, the rest of your thoughts are, rather than just mine, is he had a difficult time with this article. Part of that is because there are those that he has known that are in great, to me, danger in trying to state and place Uriah Smith as a prophet. Yeah. So there's a context in which he's writing these things. That context has to do with our movement. Right. In part one. So part two is Samson's riddle. Correct. Uh, part one, he's going to deal with what he calls the dilemma. Now, some of that has to do with the failed prediction within this movement. I think mostly about Trump. Right. Um, if I understand it correctly, not so much July 18th. So just our understanding of, and also our understanding of uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, right? So so he seems to have found some faults with what this movement, some of its basic understandings, right? Some. That's, yeah. But but generally in agree, agreement with 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 others, other things. So uh, I think it's really helpful, you know, to understand the whole context of of his arguments of what he's fighting against. As you say, like there's people who are putting Uriah Smith sort of as, as a prophet. Right. Now we see all kinds of, I'll use the word crazy stuff in what has happened with the movement, similar to what happened after uh, October 22nd, 1844, right? Right. So we just have all of these people with different interpretations sort of going off in different directions. So we we believe that there is counsel on what we should do, and that is we need to study with open minds and hearts to understand where we went wrong. And it's not about, you know, 
attacking other people or just thinking that we're right or, or pushing on, you know, up a wrong path, you know, like when you're doing rope finding up a mountain someplace where you just end up on a ledge and you're trapped, you know, we don't, we think that, you know, we, if we need to be corrected, we have to, to get on the right, right path. So um, looking at this type of stuff is really useful. Right. So, so I think you should do a series on, on all of these articles, to be honest. Okay. And, and that, you know, what you should be looking at it is, is just here is another view of basically what has happened to the movement in our basic understanding. Uh, Cause from what I can see here, he's got some ideas that, that he's putting forward dealing with Laodicea and so forth. And, and I think it would be helpful for, for us to examine these things. E even right. if we don't totally agree with them, maybe there's some things we can learn from this that we, you know, um, because this is really what we are to be doing, right? Looking at these, these other viewpoints. I don't see something in here that would, you know, say that, you know, here's a guy who's way off track like he's going in, he, he's not a fanatic in that sense. I don't see it that way from what I've read, but he, he's, he's definitely not following exactly what we're doing. I don't know how much he knows about, you know, the stuff I've done or anything. I don't know if I know who he well, is really. I will. Let's, let's consider then this for tomorrow. And I'll get some other things prepared and we'll address further a lot of where he has come from within this in the movement. All right. Yeah. It's just because it's, it's a way of examining ourselves. Right. Our, our own experience. So okay. but that's, that's my suggestion. Now I'm not going to be here for all of that. I'll be here tomorrow, but tomorrow and possibly Tuesday. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So shall we then close this session in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us to be able to consider the points and the views of others and to be able to examine ourselves. Help us now. Direct us. Guide us, we pray, so that we may bring glory to your name and to your character. Direct us each one today in all things. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.